What's up, James? Welcome to my house, brother. Yeah, man. Well, uh, very, very happy to be here. I know we talked about this for a while, you know, being able to come here, interview you. Uh, we have, we work in two totally different industries, but very parallel stories, I think. There are a lot of similarities between you and I, not just the fact that we, you know, grew up together, went to the same high school, grew up in the same area, but um, just in life and uh, things that have happened for us, really. And, um, you know, we've, where we've gotten ourselves to, um, you know, a lot of people say, uh, you know, that everybody's self-made, only the successful people will admit it. Um, and I, I would say that both you and I have, you know, uh, achieved, you know, a good amount of success in what we do, but uh, you have such an incredible story. Um, um, I'm all about, you know, the stories and really the, um, you know, there's a saying, facts tell, stories sell. And just hearing your story, I think is bring a, it brings a lot of inspiration to a lot of people um, and a lot brings a lot of belief to a lot of people as well. Um, I would love to just kind of walk through your story from, you know, starting in, uh, in your industry, starting in the real estate industry, and you know how you got to where you are now. Like, and include more, most importantly, I think that the failures, the things that just happened that uh, and you've gotten through. So, uh, you've been in real estate for how long now? Seventeen, 17 years. Seventeen now. years. Yeah, and it, it's been super easy the whole time, right? Mm, yeah, <laughs> just a piece of cake. Yeah. So, um, what? What? Uh, so, seventeen years ago when you started, um, tell me about how you got into it and. Um, what you know what you did start now well basically the uh, long story short um, I went to school I went to college to I went to four different colleges in two years I failed a history class at University of Alabama and just decided college was not for me I really didn't know what I wanted to do you know it was just kind of you know what's next after high school I didn't really have a plan so college is the next best thing that's what you're supposed to do so mm -hmm. Um, I had a scholarship to a school in Missouri, uh, Missouri Valley, uh, for football. I went there for a year and decided that was too far of a drive for an 18-year-old. I just wasn't feeling it. Um, you know, it was like 14-hour drive. Wow. So after I came back for thanks from Thanksgiving and went back to school for finals and then came back a week later for Christmas, you know, then I'm headed back. You know, just back and forth 14 hours was just too much for me at that time. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. So. I came back to Alabama and I was going to walk on at Alabama, walk on football. And so I'm working out, you know, three times a day, running miles and lifting weights and stuff. And I was actually an invited walk in, walk on by Coach DeBose. I have a letter. And uh, so I'm gearing up for that. I went, I took, I did a semester at Faulkner, which is now Coastal uh, Local Community College, transferred to Alabama, gearing up to walk on. And, you know, after like 10 years of strenuous working out, my body basically just couldn't take it anymore. Like I just wasn't, I, I wasn't built to, to play a, a, at the level that, you know, true professional athletes or even just D1, you know, college players play at. So I kind of had to face that fact. And after I failed that history class and decided I wasn't going to pursue football anymore, you know, I really didn't know what I was going to do, but real estate, I realized, was one class. One class, you get your license, you don't have to go to school for 10 years like a doctor or a lawyer. You know, it's one class, 60-hour class, and you have the opportunity to take a state test, get your license. So, you know, I'm really good at figuring out what's really efficient. You know, what move can I make that can, you know, exponentially multiply my success the fastest you know I've mm -hmm. always just had a knack of you know what small thing can I do that will end up being huge um, and I'm still doing that that's why I do so much social media YouTube you know all the things that I do are little things that produce huge results um, so you know my mom and dad you know growing up down here on the beach there's not it's not a big city there's not a lot of you know it's not wall street it's not a big city there's not a lot of like huge opportunities for you either have to be a doctor a lawyer a restaurant mm -hmm. owner a developer you know there's not there's only a handful of really sky's the limit income you know uh, occupations and real estate's one of them so i knew a lot of real estate agents my mom owned a hair salon 
and she cut a lot of their hair as I was a kid. I grew up in the hair salon answering the phone, you know, hey, this is C-Trans Hair Salon, how can I help you? And uh, I already knew a lot of these guys. They knew me as the kid, you know, at the hair salon. So real estate was a really good fit for me. So I got in when I was 20, after I got out of college, four, four schools in two years, dropped out, got my real estate license. Still didn't know if I really wanted to do it or not because I was roofing houses with my dad. And uh, after a couple of days of that, when I got back, I said, okay, I'm gonna try real estate. And I got in and um, I thought, I'm fixing to just like make it big. I'm a millionaire now, this is, everything's fixing to happen. So I quit roofing, did real estate for 30 days, sold absolutely zero, and had to go back to roofing houses. So now I'm roofing and trying to sell, trying to like start my real estate career at the same time. And that went on for eight months. It took me eight months to make my first sale. Wow. And it was a long eight months, but... How, how many, uh, I hate to interrupt you, but how many people do you think going eight months or even less than that would quit and be out of the game before that? Probably a lot, but you know what's so funny is I have a lot of newer agents reach out to me now that have been in the business for two weeks, a month, even like two or three months, really complaining, really down on their self because they don't have any sales yeah. or listings or anything. And I'm like, you know, welcome to the club, yeah. you know? Um, we live in a microwave society. Everybody wants something. Especially right now, now, like it's getting worse and worse. Yeah. Attention span is lower and people want stuff, you know, overnight. And, you know, what's so crazy is, is back then when I started, it took me eight months and there's a lot of people who it still takes eight months to make their first sale. Even with the advances in technology and how far we've come, the process is still the process. Now, I have an agent um, in Mississippi who just finished his first year. He found me before he got in real estate. Um, he's part of my program. Sold 106 properties his first wow. year. It took wow. me 12 years to get to 100 deals a year. This guy did it in one year, and in, not even in one year, in, in his first year. And the reason being is because he took advantage. Like when I started, I had to literally look up people's phone numbers by hand, type their addresses into you know search engines and find their phone numbers and then dial them with my finger one at a time. <laughs> now there's technology where you can just click a few buttons, find thousands of property owners' numbers, that it's even better data than it used to be, and then click another button and it just automatically starts dialing. You just sit there and talk to people. And you could get through 100, 200, 300 people, 300 dials in a day. Whereas I was lucky to get a hundred in. I only had like one or two days where I actually dialed a hundred numbers and actually got through all of them. Um, so what he did was, is he took advantage, he saw this and he took advantage of this technology, you know, because you think about it, it took me 15 hours to dial a hundred numbers, to, to, to look up and dial a hundred numbers, to look them up. That was most of the time. And then to dial them about 15 hours. So I would look them up all night and then dial them all day during the day. Look them up all night, dial them all day. That's what I did for months and months and years. Well, now you can literally click a few buttons and dial 100 numbers within an hour and a half. It's crazy the advances in technology. How and for people not, they have really no excuse not to succeed now. They don't know how good they have it. But think about it. It took me 15 hours to do what you can do now in an hour and a half. So it's 10 times faster. You can communicate with the same number of people 10 times faster than you could, you know, when I started. And so if you think about that and the fact that it took me 12 years to get to 100 deals, well, he just shrunk that down and did it 10 times faster and just did it in one year, you know. And so people aren't taking advantage of this, you know. They're just, it comes back to, you know, only a really small percentage of people are really going to succeed. They say 87% of agents fail in the first couple of years. They end mm -hmm. up quitting and going back to their whatever job. And it, it's, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, most people, especially in a business like this or your industry, it's such a, you're such a business owner. Like there's so many different, it's not like being an employee where you get paid to just show up or you don't, you just have one job. It's like you're everything. Mm -hmm. And most people can't, you know, handle all that. You know, they just can't handle all that. They're not built to handle everything. Um, and they're always going to make an excuse, you know. Okay. So. Um, I'm glad you just said that because I was thinking this 
on my way over here. And I think one of the things you and I have in common is we're not afraid of hard work. And a lot of people coming out of, and, and I know a lot of people do, they come out of uh, the employer-employee um, arena and coming into what is really entrepreneurship. You're, you're, you're owning your own business. You're building your own business. You're building your own brand. And most people, when they're, they have a job, they're an employee, they're doing just enough to not get fired. And they're, just, they're getting by because they're going to get a paycheck. And you know, as long as they have that job, do no, enough to keep that job, that's what they're going to do. And then if they, they take that same work ethic and then they go and try to start a business, it doesn't work that same way. I mean, you've got to really, really work at it. Yeah, um, and that, that's one of the biggest problems, I think, is because when you're an employee, you get paid by the hour. You get paid to just show up. And in this business, or as a business owner, you get paid on production. Mm -hmm. You don't get paid to just show up. There's plenty of people that just show up. But very few people understand that you have to show up and produce, you know, and there's a big difference. And a lot of people don't, they can't make the transition because they've been brought up to just work by the hour, show up, they get paid. It doesn't matter if they're scrolling on their phone all day, they get paid regardless. And so, it is hard to if you've been brought up a certain way and you've you've had things you know a certain way your whole life to come in and try to rearrange the way you think to become a business owner you know so um that i think that's one of the biggest problems out there and if we can if we can you know bring up the next generation around you know what it takes to be a business owner and what and and the the mindset behind being a producer not just someone who shows up you know what i mean mm -hmm. then i think we can produce more successful people and we can reduce the failure rate right you know so i think a lot of people you know a lot of people may look at you and say oh you know he's one in a million you know he started doing this at the right time or he's people make excuses why other people are successful and they're not and i think yeah you may be for every million uh, real estate agents, you know, you may be like you're the number one out of a million, but you're not one in a million because of luck or because of just by chance. You're one in a million because one in a million real estate agents are willing to do what you have done and willing yeah. to go through the things you've gone through. And you know, I think that's the same with any successful person. It's people look at them, oh, you know, they're they're just that one person, and it's they're that one person who's willing to do what other people aren't willing to do. So, um, yeah, I mean, the people that say that though, those are the people that aren't successful. They're not willing mm -hmm. to do what it takes and chances are they probably never will, you know? And so they're always going to look at the successful people and say, they just got lucky, you know? Um, but really deep down, I think they know that they're just insecure about, you know, their self and what they're willing to do. You know, they, they know that they're not willing to do what I do every day. You know, if they think it's luck, and, and, you know, they can come and walk a day. Not, I mean, these people couldn't even do one hour of my life, you know, and the things that I have to deal with and um, the things that I think about and trying to get to the next level. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about adapting, you know. And, and, you know, people think, and this is a true statement, people think that, you know, the, the, the Instagram you know, influencers that started in 2012 had a huge advantage because there was so much more organic growth in 2012 than it is now. And, you know, now there's so much money getting poured into Instagram from adverti advertisers mm -hmm. that it's kind of watering down the entire system. And there's not as much organic growth because, you know, now they're making so much money on ads because they built up such a huge platform. And a lot of people can say, man, I wish I could have started Instagram in 2012. I'd have a million followers right now. I'm one of those people, right? But I'm not sitting here saying that, you know, man, I wish. I'm, I'm looking for a way to still grow, um, you know, different platforms. You know, I'm on every platform. Mm -hmm. And so, like, right now, right this second, there's a platform called TikTok. Gary Vee talks about that. Yeah. And, it, and it's, you know, it's musically that was bought by Facebook and they changed the name to TikTok. Okay guys, you know, like open up your eyes right here for a second. You know, there's zero paid ads on TikTok right now. The organic growth is through the roof. Everybody on TikTok is like eight years old to high school. 
okay, in five to 10 years, they're going to be, you know, 25 to 35 years old, okay, this is a huge, huge opportunity to, to you know, this, this is Instagram in 2012 or 2010, mm -hmm. okay, this is Instagram in 2012, this is your opportunity to get out there and post consistent content every day and get a million followers within a year, two or three, depending on how good you're, how well you adapt your content as you go along and figure out what works and what doesn't work. But you can literally take that and continue to grow there, get 2 million followers, whatever, over the next five years. But then, you know, those people are watching you, all right? You turn around and, and, and can, you know, these people are gonna be, you know, our age, you know, in the next decade. They're going to be you know? massive influencers just on another platform. Right. And so they're going to know you from this. And so these are the things you have to think about when all the people are saying, I wish I would have done this. And I wish I would have done that. There's always an opportunity to, to take advantage of. If you have your eyes open, you're looking for the opportunities and then you're willing to put the work behind what it takes to take advantage of those opportunities, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for the next like little edge. Meanwhile, continuing to put out consistent content, putting in consistent work, you know, I'm selling properties every day. I'm making YouTube videos every day. This month, I'm in the middle of my 28 day real estate challenge where I do, it's one video every morning for 28 days. Okay. And I'm also doing a video in the evenings. Okay. I just posted one. You watched me. I literally filmed it before you got here, edited it, finished editing it while you were here, posted it on YouTube right before we started this interview. Um, because I'm committed to doing two videos a day on YouTube, you know, during this 28 day period. Um, that's what it's about is just trying things, figuring out what works, but putting the work in, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, you know, you said committed, um, but doing, uh, I actually read a couple of things on and watched a couple of videos on commitment and what, what holding to your own commitments to yourself will do for your level of belief. Um, just so many people, say, oh, I'm going to go do this, and then they don't do it. Or if it, oh, I'm going to go work out, but, oh, it's raining outside. I'm not going to work out today instead of working out in their house. So, you know, just so many people won't keep the commitments to themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you did, I actually put a video out Monday on uh, Facebook, uh, commitment challenge. Like, whatever your commitment is, just make a commitment every day or make a commitment for the week. Stick to that commitment and see what that does for your level of belief. And, you know, just help you realize that, you can do these things you're saying, you know, you're going to do. Uh, so, yeah, I love that. You know, a challenge like that, 28-day challenge, that's, mm. that's awesome because it helps people, you know, commit to it. Now, most people aren't going to do that. It challenges me. It, challenge, it challenges them because I'm putting a video out every day, giving them a daily challenge. Mm -hmm. And then it challenges me to actually make a video every day, giving them a challenge. But it's funny you say that because day one was viewed 7,500 times. Day two was like 6,500. It was 6,500. Yeah. Day three was, was like 5,700. Day four was like 4,500. Like it, it continuously. Mm -hmm. So we've leveled out at about 1,100 views a video. We're a week and a half in. So it went from 7,500 to 1,100 who are still, you know, watching it. And, you know, and then out of the 1,100, how many are actually putting forth the effort? You know, it, it dwindles down, you know, mm -hmm. to 1%, you know? Um, so because like you said, it's like commitment is belief. Like you, if you believe something, then you're going to commit to it. If you don't commit, that means you don't really believe, right. you know, like I, I, I believe in believing a hundred percent, you know, 100, now 99.9 .9, because that 0 0.01 is what's going to take you down. That, 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 that point zero one is the fears you have. It's the doubt in yourself. It's, you know, you're not committed. You, you don't really, you're scared to commit because you think you might actually have to work and you're scared to put yourself in that situation where now you have to put this work in. You have to enjoy all that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, believing, working hard, adapting, and being patient. You know, that, that's the four key principles. If someone's not successful or, or as successful as they want to be, I can talk to them for five or 10 minutes about their business, their philosophies, what they got going on. And I can tell you which of these four things they're either, they either don't really believe or maybe they really believe, but they're not really working hard, consistent, hard work, or they're not adapting. They're not trying new things, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work and kind of, you know, tweaking their, their, their model as they go. 
Or maybe they do all these things. Maybe they believe they work hard and they adapt really well, but then they're not patient. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're anxious. They like, why am I not making that million yet? And then, you know, once they get to the million, those kind of people, it's like, why am I not making two million yet? Mm-hmm. Why am I not making three million, ten million? You said uh, law of lag time, and a lot of businesses, a lot of people don't understand that. You know, a lot of the stuff you do now, the relationships you build now, will wind up helping you succeed down the road. It's so many, again, the microwave society, people want it now. And, you know, like what, you know, what you've built, it's not like you built it overnight. It's, you know, consistently building relationships and just pouring value into people. Yeah. You know, it's just, now it's just coming back to you tenfold yeah. down the road. But you're right. So, so I think the impatient thing is because of the way society is. And like you said, it's getting worse. It's That's probably one of the biggest ones. Yeah, it is. It's the worst one. But the the other, you have to have all four of these. It's a puzzle. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't, you know, there's there's something missing in one of these, part of one of these. If you're not successful or as successful as you want to be, there's something in one of those four things that you're missing, that you're just, you're overlooking, you don't realize it. For me, it was patience. Because in 2014, I did 600K and I wanted to do a meal the next year. And so, you know, I put together this huge plan to do a meal. I was going to talk to this many people, get this many listings, do this, that. And I had an equation, a little, you know, game plan to get there. And so I, I, the next year, I started to try to implement all this stuff. And by March, I realized I'm only going to make 600 again. So I became not deeply, I wasn't depressed. I was more deeply frustrated with the fact that why can't I do what I wanted to do here? And that year was the year I had to learn that I am doing everything I need to do. I, am, I do believe, I do work hard, I am adapting, but I got to be patient. You know, like I knew all, I knew what was going to happen. I just wasn't letting myself, you know, um, go through the process to get there. I wanted it now. Mm-hmm. And so when I learned that this, that year in 2015, that was the year that from then on, I haven't had a moment of unhappiness with where I am in my career. Like, like, like the goals that I have right now are way bigger than where I am right now, but I'm not using that as a crutch to be unhappy with where I am. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Super happy with where I am, but super hungry and motivated to go to the next level. You know, that's the ultimate, I think, is what most people are missing is being happy and satisfied with where they are, but still having this just, you know, crazy drive to get to the next level, you know? Mm-hmm. Because that, to me, that's just ultimate happiness. You know, when you're happy with where you are, but you love the process so much, and you know where you're going to be, you know, it's just a matter of time. You know, and you don't you don't try to rush the process because mm-hmm. you know that it is a process. And you know, you have to go through the process. Yeah, that, uh, I actually read a really good book on that. And one of the things we, we tell everyone is, um, by the way, the book is uh, Chop Wood. Uh, Chop Wood, Carry Water. It's a great book. It's all about the process. But in, in our industry, we tell people all the time, marry the process, divorce the result. Because you're going to have to go through, I'm sure you, so many phone calls, you're going to get told no, 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 no. That's the result of that phone call. But you're sticking with the process. You know, and then you know, what pops out on the other end you know, as, you, as you continue on that process and stop being impatient is, you know, is really the, the beauty of it. And that's where you're going to see the success. I tell everybody, this is, this is one of the biggest things you know, with impatience is everybody wants those results and they're shooting for these results. And if they see halfway through the year, they're not going to hit those results. They become depressed or frustrated. Mm -hmm. And that year, 2015, when I realized all this, I realized that the results don't matter. You can't control the results. You can only control what you do on a daily basis. You know, I want to take yesterday and I want to understand what happened yesterday, but then I want to forget yesterday. And I want to start over at zero today, and I want to go from zero to 100. I want to, I want to go to sleep tired and wake up hungry. I want to go to sleep exhausted because I put everything on the table, um, every ounce of energy, every ounce of physical energy, mental energy, to try to accomplish the bigger goal, which is to be happy and to help as many people as humanly possible you know, through, you know, not just work, but also marriage and life and friends and family, you know, baby. Yeah. You have to have it all, you know, 
I so. know you got in in 2014-15, but um, I want to take you back a little bit um, to where I think one of the most inspirational parts of your story is um, back in what, 2007, 2008. What happened back then? Well, um, where, where were you back then, and then what, ha what happened? Well, um, like I said, I got in real estate when I was 20 um, and, you know, had that slow start. Uh, once I started selling, I was selling two a month for a while. And then the market completely exploded. Prices <clears throat> doubled in about two years. I think everybody remembers that. That was around during that time. And um, I, I literally made a million dollars during that two year period. So I'm 23 and I'm a millionaire, you know. Um, I took commissions, I was flipping properties, you know, I was making so much money commissions and I was flipping properties and I was just flipping them into more properties and more properties. So, and then, you know, I'm sitting here on top of the world, I got Cadillacs and Hummers and houses. And the next thing I know, the rug basically gets, you know, jerked out from under me. And I literally fall all the way down, right on my face. and. I go bankrupt. I lose everything. I'm sleeping on friends' couches. I slept in my car a couple nights. And I went back to roofing houses. So um, during that time, when I was, you know, in my mid 20s, losing everything and, and going through that whole ordeal, I was literally just as happy then as I was before I made the meal, when I had the meal, as I am now. Um, probably a little happier now. But I, I, the reason being is because I was right next to people that were 60 and 70, you know, 50 in their 40s that were that were going through the same exact thing that I was going through in my mid 20s. And I knew it, that this was a blessing that I was able to learn. I knew that I was going to learn so much from this that it was going to take me to where I am now eventually. So I saw all this happening. You know, and I was literally just enjoying the moment. Um, I was roofing houses again. Um, you know, I, I, I got a job in an oil rig. I was, uh, you know, working on an oil rig. So some point during that down moment, I, it's something clicked and I was like, I want to know why I failed. I really want to get, like, because when it happened, I was just kind of letting the dust settle. So I was just like roofing houses, not really worrying. I was just trying to survive. But then when I got my feet under me, and started making money on the oil rig uh, with no bills. You know, I let everything go. I had, the only bills I had was a cell phone bill, and I kept my license active, you know, which is pretty minimal cost. I had a car that um, a friend gave me that was beat up, like it had no brake lights. It was You couldn't open the passenger door. I put a boom box in the back seat to listen to music, like the radio didn't work and stuff. That was the car I had for a while. And... Uh, you know, something clicked once I got my feet under me and I was like, okay, now I'm ready to try to figure this thing out. And I just started reading. I read a hundred books um, over a two year period. It's about one a week. And somewhere in there, uh, in one of those books, something clicked and I realized the reason why I failed. Uh, the, big, the biggest reason why. Um, outside of the fact that I over leveraged myself with buying all the properties and that's really kind of what took me under but the reason why I couldn't continue to sell properties and the reason that you know if I would have been able to continue selling properties I would have continued to be able to make notes and I would have I would have worked my way out of those situations without going bankrupt without losing everything without <clears throat> sleeping on friends couches so the reason that I, I figured out was that up to that point in my career it was all about the fast money the deal the transaction the closing trying to get people to just do deals so I can make money. And what I realized was that you have to, it has to be about the people. So something, one of those books may open my eyes up to this. And I also noticed that I, I was researching the market and I realized that my clients that, that were my clients when I was in business were still buying and selling properties at the bottom. When I was out of the business working on an oil rig, and, and that really opened my eyes to, you know, I could have had these deals if I would have maintained those relationships. And what I realized was that when the market crashes, <clears throat> transactions slow down, but people don't go anywhere. And closings continue to happen every single day. If you go back 
through the history of, you know, real estate, you know, through the darkest times, you know, in 2000, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, there were still transactions happening every single day. You know, prices go up and down, days on the market fluctuate, inventory fluctuates, all these things fluctuate. But the one thing that's constant is closings continue to happen every single day. And so I started putting all putting all this stuff together in my head and I started to realize what I needed to do and how I needed to do it. So in 2008, I got laid off from the oil rig. Okay, it was the year Obama came in presidency. A lot of things changed in the, in the gas and oil industry and I ended up getting laid off. And luckily enough, I had started to realize all this about six months before I got laid off and I was already dabbling in real estate, talking to property owners and trying to, you know, get back in the game. And uh, I had a couple closings lined up. It was crazy how it all happened. And I remember I got laid off from the oil rig. I had closings like 30 days out from that, two closings. And I remember the week before those closings, I had to borrow $500 from my dad just to make it through that last week to get to those closings. And I think I got like 20,000 or something, you know, for those two closings. And, um, you know, I was like, thank you, Jesus. You know, like I'm back in the game something I didn't know if I would ever be able to do again. You know, I mean, from 05 to 2008, zero sales, um, you know, lost everything, you know, sleeping on friends' couches, roofing houses, working on an oil rig. I didn't know that I would ever get back to real estate. Um, it was just kind of a thing that I just figured I would, didn't know how, and it happened. You know, it happened because I was curious of why I failed. I read all those books. I kept studying the market. I kept watching the agents that got out of the business like me. I was watching the ones that continued to sell through the crash. There's a lot of agents that continued selling through the crash. And I was like, what's going on here? And so, um, you know, just learning, learning what happened through all that, um, you know, opened my eyes up to, to what was possible. And, and how you can actually handle a market crash, you know. So when the market crashes, you just adapt, you know. The market's changing all the time anyway. A crash is no different. What I realized is that there's no such thing as like a recession or a crash or a depression for real estate agents. There's only three kinds of markets. There's a buyer's market, a seller's market, and a mixed market where it's kind of balanced between buyers and sellers. You know, it, it's either, you know, the buyers have the advantage because of the way the market is, the sellers have the advantage, or it may, it's kind of balanced out. But that's it. There's not, there's not a fourth market where there are no closings or, you know, everything goes away. Even 9-11, even you know, in 2001, um, even 9-11 was, uh, you know, it, it, closings continue to, you know, it, you know there's, nothing, there's nothing that's happened out there that's just stopped sales. People are still moving. People still buying houses. You know, like if your mom dies, it you know, like people die regardless of what the market's doing. And now your heirs have to sell the house. Okay? If the market, you know, something happens with the market, you lose your job, you gotta sell your house. Or it goes into foreclosure. If it goes into foreclosure, what happens then? My client buys it out of foreclosure, you know, mm -hmm. or I buy it out of foreclosure. So it, there's just it, the pro, it, things fluctuate, but if you understand that it's about people, and if you take the approach of what can I do to help you, not do you want to buy or sell, you know, not will you buy or sell so I can make a commission. I don't really care about that. I just want to know what you do want to do, and I want to help you develop a game plan to do that. If it's not to do anything for two years, great. Is there an agent you would work with in that two year when it, when it happens? No? Cool. I'd like to stay in touch. Um, you know, if you want to do something in six months, okay, why? You know, why do you want to do it in six months? What's going on? You know, what's the bigger reasons behind why you're buying why? or selling? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing in, in sales in general. It's like, this is what I do. How can I help you? Okay, that's what you want to do. Why? Okay, cool. Well, since that's the reason, here's what we need to do. You know, I mean, that's just sales 101, I think, for the future. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's the sales script one on one, you know, moving forward in the industry. You know, that's the sales script. The philosophy of sales moving forward is quit charging people a thousand dollars for coaching or for your course. You know, mm -hmm. give it all for free, provide the value because my friend coach Michael Burt says, Would you want a, a billion dollars or a billion friends? You know, do you want a billion dollars? 
or would you want a billion friends instead of that million that billion dollars? Okay? Everybody says a billion friends, why? Because <laughs> you can make so many more billions of dollars off of a billion friends. Mm -hmm. So if the object is to get friends, <laughs> not dollars, okay, what's the quickest way to get friends? To say, hey, I've accomplished this. I want to tell you how to do it for nothing. Mm -hmm. And now they love you forever. That's how you build an audience, you know. And moving forward, this is the new business model, you know, for influencers and, you know, uh, you know, coaches and trainers and speakers. This is the new business model moving forward. You know, I think that there's there's a couple people doing this right now, but I think I'm I think I'm one of the pioneers in this give the information for free without charging uh, industry. And, um, you know, it's a land grab. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, if I'm charging, then people, um, people go through your, your content, they get to the part where, where you charge them and they say, okay, I knew, Got I it. knew it, yeah. <laughs> you know, I knew that he was going to try to charge me something. Um, thanks, but no thanks. I enjoyed it up to this point, but I don't want to have to pay to see any more. See you later. And you lose that person forever. Whereas if you just give it all for free, they get in there and they, they not only like you, but they love you because you, you gave them the real value. You said it was free and then you gave, you, 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 mm -hmm. you, you did what you said you were going to do. And that's when you really grow, you know, that personal brand. You know, as somebody who does what they say they're going to do, you know? I, you know, I always like to believe that things happen for you, not to you. And I think you realize that going through what you went through, you know, you learned a lot of lessons through it. You had a lot, obviously a lot of perseverance. Um, and probably the large majority of the people who were in real estate at that time aren't anymore, or at least for a long while weren't in real estate because... A lot of people will deal with stuff like that and say, you know, woe is me mentality. Oh, look what happened to me. You know, look, look, you know, it sucks that this happened to me, you know. And I think you kind of figured out, like, this happened for you. Is it like you've, from just, you know, hearing you talk, it sounds like you figured out why it happened for you. It, it had did it not happen, you wouldn't have read 100 books. You wouldn't have read that book that made something click in your head and say, hey, you know, I know your motto, relationships over transactions. You know, and I need to focus on truly helping this person get what they want and not trying to figure out how to make money from this person. And I think that's what, a, and you know, a lot of people, it, that's really sales in general. You know, um, it should be sales 101. Um, you know, how can you help this person, not how can you sell somebody something? Um, and I think you, you realize that, you know, early on and that a lot of people, it's just, it's, it takes so many people so, so long to realize that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think you've really mastered that and you've, you've definitely through social media, you've put that out there, you know, that's, that's how you do so well. Um, what would you say keep, keeps you producing at such a high level? What, what is it that has Ricky Carruth just, just dominating, um, in, in, this industry and in the real estate industry, you know, you know, top agent in the state and just producing at such a high level. Well, I mean, it's just the fact that I know I can do it, you know, and if I don't do it, then, you know, I won't be able to sleep at night kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just, I'm addicted to the process. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, you know, I get a high off of each level that I hit. You know, um, I've pretty much plateaued out on my real estate business, you know, um, because I'm spending so much time trying to grow my social media presence and my coaching business. Um, you know, so so the real estate business is kind of plateaued, but then I'm, I'm almost doubling my income with the coaching business. Um, so I would have to fair to say especially this fast, there's no way in the world I could have doubled my income if I'd have just stayed, you know, there's no way I could just strictly do real estate and would have been able to double my income. Maybe, um, it's possible, who knows, but, you know, I wasn't doing social media with real estate at all, you know, up mm -hmm. to the point that I started coaching, I wasn't doing social media whatsoever. And so, I actually, I feel like looking back on it, I needed 
to get into the coaching industry to just so that it would kind of make myself get into the social media world because man, it, it's global, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, you have the whole world in the palm of your hand, you know, that you can communicate, um, you know, whatever your message is and, and help people and, and grow that audience and grow that brand. And I wasn't doing that, you know, so my social media, you know, presence is all focused around helping agents succeed and doing it for free. Um, it's not necessarily real estate. You know, I have real estate. I do a little bit of my real estate business on social media, but I focus more on, you know, the coaching industry and, and speaking and writing books and doing all the different things that I do. Um, but I know that I can do it. Like, I know I can be the number one coach in real estate. I know I can be the top influencer in real estate. I know I can be the top influencer in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that I can do these things. And if I don't give it everything I have to, to, to make it happen, then I'm always, then I'm going to look back and regret, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't try, you know, I knew I could do this, you know, but I just said the heck with it. I just, to be honest with you, bro, I, I really don't know what else I would do. You know, like, why do I keep doing stuff? Why do I keep at it? Why do I keep, you know, um, producing? Why do I keep pushing so hard and stuff? I literally don't know what else I would do. You know, what, what, what else, is, what else would I do? Like just sit around, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I would do. You know what I mean? What do people do that don't, you know, try to push themselves to the next level and I mean what what do people watch do? Watch TV, sit around on the couch and, and I watch TV live, sometimes. Yeah live, a, yeah, live a super mediocre I, I know, watch TV sometimes, like at night, you know, when I'm going to bed, I turn the TV on and kinda of fall asleep to TV. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, watching T V all day long, you know what I mean? That that's gotta get boring. Mm-hmm. You know? So at some point the people that are watching T V all day long, I mean, at some point they gotta say you know, this is this is boring. So what what would they what would they what would those people graduate to? Right. I, I'm just saying, like, there's there's nothing else there's nothing else to do. You know, and, I mean, and a lot of uh, a lot of coaches and a lot of agents, they don't understand why I'm doing all this either. You know, they're like you like you know you you could have a team, Ricky. You could have a team of agents under you that's doing all your real estate stuff. You wouldn't have to do anything and still make money. You know, they don't understand. They don't they don't understand why I am editing videos and, and like doing that when I can hire that out easily. You know, and I do, I hire out a lot of it, but I do some of it too. Um, people don't understand why I still show property, you know, or go on listing appointments or make phone calls. They don't they don't understand. Mm-hmm. And my, my rebuttal is what else am I going to do? You know what I'm saying? Like I'm trying to get somewhere fast. Mm-hmm. You know, as fast as I could possibly get there. And if I'm not putting in the work and doing the things that it takes to get there, I'm not going to get there. You know, if I live in a world where, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? I could I could not be doing this. It trips me out all the people out there that are trying to work so hard to put themselves in a position where they don't have to work. Mm-hmm. I'm literally trying to figure out how when I'm in 10 years, how I can work even more hours. You know, like in my mind, I'm trying to figure out where can I squeeze another hour in to my day. I got to where I was waking up at 4.30 every day. No, I am waking up at 4.30 every day because I get so many DMs on Instagram. And it was just, I had no time to answer all the DMs. And I was like, okay, where where can I get an extra hour to answer all these messages? Because these messages are real messages of people that need real help with legitimate questions that are dying for somebody to just tell them, you know, the answers to this stuff and help them with their situations. You know, it's it's like, if I don't answer those, those DMs, it's like, I'm turning my back on the industry. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I feel obligated. So where can I squeeze another hour in? Okay. 4.30 to 5.30. I can squeeze an hour in there. So for the past six months or more, I've been getting up at 4.30 answering DMs for an hour before I go to the gym, you know? And, and I'll do it again. Like, I'll, I'll figure out some way I can squeeze another hour in the day, you know, at some point in the future when I need another hour. You know what I mean? And it's crazy because I still have time to do what I want to do. Like, I do what I want to do every day. 
Um, like today, the wind blew for the first time in like two months, and I was able to go kite surfing. You know, something that I haven't done for two months, but in the wind, just like... In the middle of the day. In the middle of the day. On a day, Thursday. 10 mm -hmm. o'clock. Yeah. 10 o'clock, I met my buddy. We, we went for two hours. Can't look at your phone during that time. Couldn't answer, you know, like you're out there in the wind, in the ocean, in the, in the waves. And, um, you know, like anytime the wind blows... You know, 90% of the time, there might be 10% when I'm obligated to a meeting or something, but 90% of the time I can cut off spur of the moment and go do that for two hours anytime I want. Um, people would really freak out if they actually knew how much freedom I have, mm -hmm. you know, and how much, and if they understood how much freedom I have, I think they would have a deeper understanding of how much I love the work because I'm literally doing it because I want to. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do this anymore. You know, like I, I could call it a day. I can quit anytime I want. I'm doing it because I love to do it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you know, I, I know we've talked before about, you know, your dreams and building your brand and, you know, wanting to build it up the biggest, the fastest. And, um, you know, you just got, you know, you have a lot of aspirations to do that. And uh, I heard a quote the other day. It kind of hit me really hard and it, um, there's a lot of truth to it. Like one of the greatest burdens, and you're about to have a child, so you know, uh, you'll know this for sure. Uh, but one of the greatest burdens that you can a parent can place on their children is the unrealized dreams of the parent. Mm -hmm. And you know, so many people just don't live up to their ability. You know, people are so much more powerful and can do so much more than they believe they can. They just don't know it. They haven't. They haven't given themselves that opportunity to believe in themselves. That or they haven't had someone else you know, beside them along the way, a mentor saying, Hey, you, you, you could do so much more. You're better than this. Um, so it's just seeing you go to like your full potential. It's, it's really an awesome thing to see. Uh, cause 99.99% .99 of people don't do it. They, they don't realize what they, what they're capable of doing. And mm -hmm. you've kind of figured that out for yourself, like what you're truly capable of. Uh, there's a quote of her before. Um, the, the, the only statistic that really matters is, has it ever been done before? And I think taking it a step further in your case, in my case as well, um, a greater statistic is, have I ever done it before? You know, and you knew how to be successful in real estate before. And um, so you, and you've also, you know, you lost it all, but you knew starting back at it, you knew that what you, you know, not to the full potential now that you know what you're capable of, but you knew you were capable of selling houses and, and getting back into it. Um, what, what is the, the number one thing that you believe you've protected yourself against any crash? Like what, what is the number one thing you've done to, um, build that security or I guess like insurance, you know, in case of another crash? I mean, it, just realizing that a crash doesn't affect you, you know, people think crashes affect them, but they don't. Okay. Their net worth may go down. You know, if you have a lot of stocks, stock market crashes, you know that your net worth is lower. Um, you know, but if you're if you're young, you not you shouldn't really be worried about that. You're investing long term. You know, when you get to the long term part where you're in your 60s or something, you need to sell the stocks and put it in a more secure asset, some bonds, some this and that, some mutual funds, whatever, so you won't get hit with the with the big crash like. A regular stock could could see um, you know so uh, just realizing like where like I think the biggest thing is is sometimes you have to go through one of these situations to, to really appreciate it and understand that's what's so cool about me coaching agents is because I've been there you know there's a lot of like I'm really weary of listening to people who haven't ever lost mm -hmm. you know um, if you haven't ever lost, then you don't know what not to do. If you lost, then you know what not to do because you lost really big. And so, you know, going through it taught me what not to do, you know, over leveraging myself, you know, with short term, uh, goals with that leverage, you know, what really, what really gets you is, is, you know, if you're investing short term, if you, if you bet big on short term investments, and then something happens short term, it's going to crush you. You know what I'm saying? Right. But if you if you're investing long term, it doesn't matter if anything happens short term, right? And so what, I'm diversified with this. Like I have long term investments, 
And then I have short-term investments. My short-term investments are all cash. You know, I, I flip houses, you know, one or two a month. And, but I pay cash for those. My long-term rentals that I, that I plan on keeping for a long, long time, 10, 20, 30 years, um, I finance those. So like I have those financed where the, the rent pays more than the mortgage. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if the market crashes, people still need places to live. So that's going to continue. That's, that's safe. And then if I buy houses that are short term investments, but pay cash. Okay. And I'm holding on to this house for cash and the market crashes. Well, that's fine because I'm not paying enough. Can't get a foreclosed on. Now I can turn around and rent it if I need to, or I can sell it for a loss if I want to take, what cash I can out of it and then live to fight another day. If that happens, I could take a loss on the one or two houses I own because I only own like one or two at a time. I could take a loss on those, but then I know what the new market is. So mm -hmm. I can take that loss, but I still have that cash and other cash that I keep. And so I can, I can now buy uh, even cheaper, you know, so I can still see that those profits on my flips. So like when a market crashes, you may have temporary, you know, problems. You know, you may have temporary business problems, temporary financial problems, you know, um, but that, that's the transition period of the market mm -hmm. shifting. Okay, kind of caught you off guard for a second. But if you're not over leveraged in the wrong things, if you're not over leveraged with, into short term investments, then you're fine. You know, and so I think that's the biggest thing there on the investment side. Mm -hmm. And then as far as business goes, you just understand that it's about people. And when the market crashes, we're going to reach out to everybody that, you know, every single client that we have ever, you know, when the market decides to take a big downturn, that means that things are going to slow down pretty abruptly, temporarily, maybe a couple months, six months. Okay. And at the end of that six months, the market's still going to be down. But that's going to give people time to adjust to the new market and then get ready to figure out how they want to handle it. Mm -hmm. So when the market abruptly stops, what we do is now, since it stopped, now we have all this time in front of us. Okay. We have all this time. A lot of people freak out, you know, the business stopped and they have all this time, but they don't know what to do. So they get out of the business. And what you have to do is you have to take that time and just go back through all of your contacts and call them and say, hey, did you see that the market crashed? Cool, look, what do you wanna do? Because people only wanna do one of three things when the market crashes. They either wanna buy, because it's cheap, and they wanna buy right now before it goes up. They gotta sell, they're in trouble, you know, the market crashed on them, or they're gonna hold, ride it out. Mm -hmm. that, 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 there's only three options. They're gonna, they're gonna buy more, they're gonna sell what they got, or they're just going to hold on and stay where they're at. That's it. Mm -hmm. There's only three things. Would you say that most agents would look at um, making those phone calls, get someone saying, no, I don't, I don't want to buy or sell. You know, I'm just going to hold. Well, would a lot of them look at that as a rejection, just take that personally and just say, oh, you know, it's look at it negatively and just start talking themselves out of the game. Yeah, most of them do. Um, but you know, the best piece of sales advice I ever got, definitely one of the best, was from my first broker. He, uh, and I didn't really realize what he was telling me until you know I went through the crash and I learned it was about you know relationships and people. But he, this is what he told me this in in my first year when I was going through those eight months of no sales and I was just I was kind of frustrated, you know, and I was just like, what am I doing wrong? And I was you know having a lot of conversations with him and. He told me, and it did, I'm telling you, it didn't hit me for a long time after this, but you know, during my first year, he told me that no, when they tell you no, it doesn't mean no. It means not right now. And that was, that was really big to me later when I realized what he was telling me. But um, it's such good advice because um, you know, if you look at it in terms of, and, and th th like some of my best clients never even bought a piece of property from me. I, I, I made a, such an impression and built such a huge relationship, such a deep relationship with them. They've referred me so many people and they've never even bought or sold a piece of property with me. Some of my best clients have never even bought or sold a property with oh, me. Big. And so, I mean, it, it, it goes to the, like, you, I'm never going after a deal. That's the thing. I'm never going after a deal. I want to know what I can do for you, not what I can't do for you. 
Like sometimes when I'm making calls and people don't realize who I am or something, they just think I'm another agent. You know, they'll pick up the phone. I'll tell them who they are, who I am. They'll immediately say, I don't want to sell my house. Okay. And I'm like, good. That's not why I'm calling. You know what I'm saying? I'm calling to see what I can do for you. You know, not, I don't care what, I, I don't care what you don't want to do. You know, I want to know what I, what you do want to do so I can help you do that. Okay. Let's go with, let's go in this direction. And I literally don't care if somebody does a deal. When I'm showing property, I'm not sitting there saying, we need to make an offer on this. Or, you know, I'm not saying, look at the blinds, look at this extra room. I'm not saying any of that. I'm walking around being quiet, letting the husband and wife walk around and make their own, you know, assessment of, of what they think about the house. I don't want to interject into their thoughts. You know what I mean? I want them to feel very comfortable. Your job as a salesperson is to make people feel comfortable, period. That's it. People feel comfortable with you. They're going to do business with you when they get ready to do business. You know, a lot of people are, are all about, you know, trying to pressure people, pressure people, you know, sell, sell, sell. And I'm telling you, that is something that is like it, it, the way of the future is low pressure sales, you know, and that's why I'm trying to get on the forefront of this because I see the direction of the industry and I want to spread this message as far as I can so that I can help as many people, as many salespeople as I can not have to get out of the business because they were taught these scripts that made people feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? The mainstream so sleazy salesman. Yeah, the yeah. mainstream scripts, the mainstream sales scripts make prospects feel very uncomfortable mm -hmm. and thus not do business with the agent or the salesperson that was talking to them. And so the agent or salesperson is sitting here doing everything that their coach told them to do, everything their broker or boss told them to do, and they don't know why they can't sell anything. And the fact is that, you know, the, the prospects are running away from them because they're using these scripts that make prospects feel uncomfortable. Whereas if they would just call them up, see how they're doing, I'm enjoying the day, isn't it gorgeous, cool, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do this, or house sold around the corner, or whatever you're, sell, whatever you're selling, and I didn't know if there's anything I could do for you today and then let them talk and really listen to them, you know, and go back through all those questions we talked about. You know, this is what I do. How can I help you? Okay. Why do you want to do it? This is how, this is how I think we should do it as a professional. You know, let me know what you think. Let's do this. You know, if not cool, you know, let's stay in touch, you know, and when you get to a point, a part where you treat everybody like their family, you know, where every person is like an extended part of your family, that's when you start winning. That's uh, that's really big because I, I think a lot of people would look at a relationship and say, oh, well, they didn't purchase something for, uh, from me or, you know, I didn't make a sale with that person. And it's like it's a closed door and they don't realize, like you said, your biggest clients are the, the people who haven't even bought a piece of property from you. They're, they're, they love you. You've built a great relationship with them. They're happy to refer because they trust you. They're happy to, to refer their friends, their, their other business professionals that they're involved with. Because uh, why? To you. Because I built, because I continue to build personal brand with them, showing them who I really am, mm -hmm. you know? And so they see that consistent content, you know, they see that consistent content. They say that consistent content means he's a hard worker. That's the thing about social media is, is when you post consistently, it's showing your followers that you are a consistent person and that translates to he's a hard worker. Consistency is something I want to talk about. So um, do you think in, in, in the span of time that you've gotten back into you know, selling real estate again to where you're at now, if, if you can even just think about this, if you weren't consistent, if you were taking a week off, you're taking several days off and just doing it in chunks and just do you think you'd be anywhere near where you are right now? Every day counts. Every single day. You know, there's a book called The Slight Edge, and it's a lot like the book that's called The Compound Effect. Mm -hmm. They're very similar with the ideas. And it, it, it's the philosophy is, you know, that the little things that you do on a daily basis add up to be so huge over time. Um, and so even just one day, you know, one day, it, 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 it means a lot in the long term that you don't even realize because all these little things add up, you know. And so I know agents that do this and salespeople. I know people that do this. They, 
they'll make some sales. You know, real estate is very lucrative. You can sell two properties and make, you know, 20, 30,000. And there's a lot of agents that take that and then they just take off mm -hmm. for several months. And then they'll come back. And these agents are really good agents. You know, they're really good salespeople. They, they actually have the skills and ability to just come back and sell something in a week. A lot of people can't do that. You know, but, but there's agents who, who are very good and, you know, they'll leave for three months. They won't do anything for three months and then boom, they'll pop up again. Hey, what's going on? Okay, boom, I sold this thing. See you later kind of deal. And it's like, man, if that person would actually work like I work and put that, you know, like he would outsell me. You know, that's what's so crazy. Mm -hmm. There's people that are way, ta tremendously more talented than me. You know, with people, with communication, with making people feel comfortable. They're, you know, I've developed this skill. There's people that are naturals at this, and are are their their natural ability is so high, and but their work ethic is so low. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's where that's where I win. Mm -hmm. You know, is that I can get to the same skill level. I may not have been born with it, but I can get there. And then when I get there, I'm also still outworking you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's you can't you can't have millionaire dreams with minimum wage work ethic. And going back to what we were saying before, you know, a lot of people just come out of this doing the bare minimum, the employer employee um, arena, coming into where you got to be an entrepreneur. Just doing that bare minimum, and they, they make the money they want to make. They're happy with it. Yeah. You mentioned the slight edge. Um, something Jeff Olson says in that book uh, that really hit me. That was, you know, I know you said like that was kind of like a uh, flip the switch book for you. Uh, it was for me as well. That was like one of the first books I read when I got into the industry that I'm in. And um, he's, he talked about how everything you do, every every minute, every second of the day, you're not just staying the same. You're either getting closer to your goals or you're getting further away. And it also, it, like, it kind of, kind of scares me. It, it really puts a little fear in me because it, it, I don't want to slide backwards. I don't want to get further away from my goals. So, I'm in a lot of ways. I'm, you know, I'm a lot like you in that sense, where, like, every minute I have to be improving on some area in my life that's important to me. If it's being a father, you know, becoming a better husband you know, growing my business, you know, bigger, um, it, it's, I got to be doing something. I can't, I can't just sit down and watch TV all day. I can't, you know, but you you do have to have the recharge times. You do have to have the time where you, you like kite surfing, you, yeah. you know, cut out and, you know, say, Hey, you know, I, uh, got to recharge and come back and just hit it hard again. Um, so it's, I love what you said about how some people are naturals. You know, they, they have that natural skill. They go out and sell. Mm. Um, but what you've done is you've developed that skill. You've you've you have the importance of yourself. You've uh, continued to develop that skill and become better. But it's kind of like the, the tortoise and the hare thing. You know, some some of these people they, they get distracted along the way. They're not consistent. You have you have stayed consistent and you've built that skill along the way, and that's why you're winning. And that's why you are the top agent. You know, that's that's why you're where you're at. And, and that's there's so many parts to your story that you know, a lot of people just you know they take for granted and they don't see that. Um, it's just you know you you have consistency is so big in in everything in life. Consistency is big. Um, I want to like switch gears here and uh, go back to I know the answer for you, uh, I believe, but uh, I was watching uh, Ed Milet. Uh, interview and he said most people, the majority of people have um, have a, a check that can be written to pay them for their dreams, to give up on their dreams. And the check would be in the form of um, hey look, you, you never have to get told no again. Here, just take this. And, you know, you, you Don't worry about it. You know, people give up on their dreams because it's getting told no so many times or hey, you never have to go through a crash again. You never have to go through failure again. You know, you you know, you never had to get somebody uh, curse you out on a Fizbo call. <laughs> you never had to worry about that again. Um, is there is there uh, is there a check that someone can write you and say, hey Ricky, you know, you, you don't have to you don't have to, you know, go through any hard work again. You don't have to work super hard. There no, there's nothing. I mean, I do what I want to do every day. You know, like on my birthday 
I do the same thing that we're doing right now, you know, selling properties, trying to help people, you know, making videos, producing content, answering DMs, um, you know, traveling, speaking, writing books, um, trying to come up with my next idea that's going to help people. Um, you know, uh, no, there's, there's nothing, dude, if there's something I don't want to do, I'm, I just don't do it. You know what I mean? There's nothing, everything I do is what I want to do. You know, there's nothing that I get up in the morning and say, oh man, I wish I didn't have to, you know, do this or do that. It's like every single part of it is fun. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So there, there's nothing I can think of that I'm like, man, write me a check that says that I don't have to do this or that anymore. You know what I'm saying? It's literally like, I, I'm... I'm in like the state of my, I'm in, I'm in the mind state of like, I'm retired, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I'm just doing what I want to do, you know, but I'm still, you know, in my mid thirties. So the level that I'm able to, to relax at and do the fun things is a very high level, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of where I'm at, you know? I think a lot of people would, they, they would try to start doing what you're doing, but they don't, you know where you're going. You see how big this can get. You you see how big your brain can get. You 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 are already in the you know in the midst of it now. So you see this playing out because you've already had that you have the perspective of the last several years and how this has grown over the year. How your social media has grown over the last couple of years, and a lot of people would you know try to start doing what you're doing without a long term vision. Yeah. And and because they don't have the long term vision, that check can be written for them. Yeah, you know, but you see that, and that's what it's so important to have that that vision. Yeah, I mean the what, like what I see happening, you know, the what whatever I have to do now for what what is happening, the reality, what's happening, you know, over the next even one year, two years, five years, ten years, you know, it's gonna be nuts. And so the stuff that I'm doing now is actually fun to me, and to know that the things that I'm doing that are fun now is actually what's gonna produce. The things that I see happening over the next decade is insane to me, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's probably what makes it fun is knowing that all these little things. Exactly. Are, yeah. Exactly. You know, if I was doing this for minimum wage or something, sure. You know, this. You know, um, you know. Uh, but the fact that you know I'm, I'm doing like, and it, it's not because. Uh, you know, minimum wage. Oh, if you wouldn't do it for minimum wage, you wouldn't, you know, why are you saying you love it if you wouldn't do it for minimum wage? The thing is, is I don't feel like I am making any money. You know, I'm literally doing this for fun. You know, mm -hmm. like, I, I'm, like I'm, I'm, I'm making money for fun. I'm producing content for fun. I'm selling properties for fun. You know what I mean? And it's just a different way to look at it, but it, it's a very fulfilling way to look at it, you know? And it gives you a sense of gratitude you know, happiness and, you know, empathy for people who don't, you know, don't view it that way, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one thing I like to try to share with people, you know, like a lot of what I do is trying to get people to think like I think, you know. Yeah, that, that's big. And, and I love how you, you've made the, the process fun because you, you see the end result and you, you you don't just see it like you believe that it, it will happen. It's going to happen. You got to believe. Yeah. <laughs> you got to yeah. believe 100% or it won't happen. Yeah. And then that check can be written. I don't you like to give myself a, a, an option. You know, like I don't, I don't want a plan B. You know, a plan B just sets yourself up to fail plan, plan A. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a plan B sets plan A up to fail. Um, you know, I want to I wanna say this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this happen. You know, there's not another option. This is what I'm going to do. So, you know, I've always kind of had that mentality. Um, but I always have a lot of irons in the fire, too. Like, you know, um, when I didn't sell something the first 30 days, I immediately went back on the roof. You know, when the market crashed, you know, that next day, you know, after I decided that I that this wasn't, that I was going under, I was on the roof the next day. There was no, like, dead time. You know how a lot of people, they lose a job, and then they just don't have a job for, like, a couple months because they're mm -hmm. looking for another job? That doesn't happen to me. Like the very next day, I'm doing something. I remember one time um, I was roofing with my dad, and me and him got in a fist fight over a tape measure. You know, I put it in the wrong bucket the day before. You know, when we were cleaning up, I put it in the wrong bucket in the back of his truck, and he couldn't find it. You know, and then he uh, he found it. You know what I'm saying? But he was so mad the whole time looking for it, and then he found it, and we got an argument over it, 
and we literally got like in a fist fight over it. And I literally walked home. It was like, cause we, we left the house. We're at the gas station on the corner, which is a couple miles away, you know, and that's where the fight happened. I walked home from there. Well, I, I walked home and looked in the yellow pages and I went to the R's and looked for roofers and I like called like three of them and like found somebody that wanted a roofer that day and, and went, you know, and worked that day, you know, <laughs> like a lot of people would have went home and said, I've got to fight with my dad yeah. and just like took the rest of the day off. And I don't, again, I don't know what people do like when they're not, you know, working or whatever, but um, I literally went and I remember like working that day and I worked for like two days with that guy and you know, me and my dad made up and I went back to work with him. But there's never any downtime. It's the same thing with real estate, you know, like it's phone calls, phone calls, phone calls. Okay, now we're busy because of all the phone calls we made. Oh, now we're not busy because we haven't been making calls, but we did all this business. But now, okay, we fill that up. Mm -hmm. There's never any dead time. Like the level of effort and energy stays here the whole time. The market does this, but the level of energy does this. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a seasonal, you know, like real estate is seasonal. In the winter time, it slows down a little bit. A lot of agents take off during that time. They're just, you know, again, I don't know what they're doing. They're not making the calls okay. anytime. They're not stuffing the pipeline. I don't know yeah. what they're doing, but see, it, when, when the market drops off, that means I have time to make calls. Mm -hmm. You know, any moment of downtime, I'm going to fill it up with something that's super productive. And that's how I close the gap on people because most people lay down during different seasons or the market crashes, like whatever it is, why people slack mm -hmm. or, or give themselves a break, that's when I go harder, you know, to put more effort in to try to build more brand, you know, to get to get ahead. That's smart. You know, we, uh, in our industry, the health and, well, health and wellness industry, uh, it's seasonal. And uh, you can imagine, you know, coming up in January, it's like, you know, it goes nuts. And everybody has those New Year's resolutions, but it's, a lot of people want to start really working when it picks up, they're too late. They're too late. They didn't lay the groundwork, you know, they didn't plant those seeds in the in the downtime and the slow time. And that's why that's when we really hit it hard. Mm -hmm. Then then we hit it so hard in that downtime. Come the busy seasons, we're we're so busy, it's it's almost overwhelming. And that's how you know we just pass everybody up and just crush it. One of my chapters in my first book was Champions Are Made in the Off Season. And it's a philosophy that, you know, when, when it slows down in the winter, that's when you really go hard. And that's how you, and I started doing this, I, f I forget what year it was, but I realized the seasons and I realized kind of, okay, that gives me time to make calls. And so I started trying to make it a point to really go harder in the winter. And what happened was, is I wouldn't sell as much as I did in the busy season, but see, years before I started doing this, I wouldn't really sell anything through the winter, mm -hmm. you know, because I was one of these that slacked off. I didn't understand how it all worked. But then when I realized it, I adjusted, I adapted, and I started working harder in the, in the, in the winter because it was like, okay, that's the time that I actually build my brand with more people that never, didn't know me before. That way, the next year's busy season, I have a bigger base of people going into the busy season. Mm -hmm. And then the next winter comes and I build my base more, and then the busy season happens and I grow more and then the next, you know, and, and I just stair step it every year. Mm -hmm. And I literally use this strategy to, to produce more. That I, I literally think that this is the reason why I grew so much over like a five year period of time to get to, you know, to grow so fast. Cause I went from making like 150 to like three years later doing like a million, you know? And so like, it was literally this strategy is what got me there and you know, I call it, you know, championships are made in the off season because they literally are. That's when all the football players are working out the hardest mm -hmm. is in that off season to get ready for the next season. It's the same philosophy. They're and too late if they start when season starts. And what I found was is that through that, I went from not closing any deals at all really in the winter to I wouldn't close as many, but I would still have consistent closings. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, you know, three or four a month. It was more like one or two or maybe one month with none, but like I had enough sales to make myself feel good that at least I was still kind of having some kind of consistent sales, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was a good feeling, you know? So I was able to keep my sales going through the winter as well as build a bigger database during the winter for the next busy season each year. And just continue to grow, grow, grow each year. 
I really appreciate the uh, the time that you've been able to take out of your day. I mean, I know you're, you've already taken some time out today, a couple hours kite surfing. Um, so, uh, but uh, I'm glad that we've been able to finally connect and do this. And I would love, you know, in the future, you talk more about more about habits that you've created, and um, more on your work ethic, and uh, just little things, little nuggets that can you know can help other people that would apply to anyone, not just you know in in your industry or my industry, but really apply to anyone, just in life in general or in business, and and talk more about how to help entrepreneurs like yourself and myself. So. Uh, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate Absolutely, it. Absolutely, bro. Thank you so much. Thank and you, we'll, bro. Um, I'm looking forward to the next time.